All right. Hi, folks. Thank you for joining us in the Vermont Wild Kitchen. And we're going to show you how to break down a shank into Asabuco portions. This came from a good friend of mine. He does small batch, Sherikoi, and other indigenous corns. Also have two cups of last year's fiddleheads, the celery, onions, carrots, adds flavor and body to the meat and the liquid. Asabuco translates to bone with a hole, and when you expose those marrow bones, it just makes them 10 times more delicious. Wow. We're really excited today because we have a really special guest, and we have uh, Jesse Lawyer, who is a citizen of the Missisquoi Abenaki and the executive chef at Sweetwaters in Burlington. He's going to be doing some really great cooking with uh, some really fresh local ingredients and uh, really just demonstrating a couple of great ways um, and connecting this all back to, you know, the Abenaki food ways that he has been uh, at the forefront of promoting here, not only in Vermont, but around the region and the country. So to get us started, I just want to say uh, we're really excited to have you all here. Uh, the Vermont Wild Kitchen is a collaboration between Rooted in Vermont and the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, we're really trying to celebrate how all folks do local food, and that includes these amazing wild ingredients. And uh, we encourage you all to get involved. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat. Uh, if you have um, insights or um, suggestions on ways that you've cooked, please, again, drop them in the chat. And feel free to interact with us on social media. Uh, you'll see uh, Jesse has his Instagram handle at the Dawnland Kitchen in his, uh, in his name. And we also encourage you to use the hashtag VT Wild Kitchen on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as well. So without that, without um, further ado, I'm going to throw this over to Jesse, who's going to be taking us uh, along the ride for an hour. And if you all have questions, please, uh, again, like I said, drop them in and we'll get them we'll get them going. So Jesse, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll let you go from here. Hello and everybody, thank you for coming. Um, welcome to my home kitchen in the new north end of Burlington. As Shana has said, I am a citizen of the Missisquoi Abenaki based in Swanton. I'm also the executive chef of Sweetwaters on Church Street. I've been there total almost eight years and I've been the executive chef for four. And the last three years, I've really been focusing on not only indigenous foodways, but Abenaki foodways and learning our crops, learning our wild game, how to cook them, you know, both with modern techniques and traditional techniques. Here today, we're going to be doing a venison asabuco with some grits and a fiddlehead gremolata. So it's kind of my take on a classic Italian dish where we're gonna indigenize it. So let's get to it. First thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna tilt the camera and we're gonna show you how to break down a shank into asabuco portions. So first thing I'm gonna do Pat it dry. I'm going to take my utility knife. You can use a boning knife, whatever you have. Um, just remove this little section, reserve it for, for later. That would be good grind for burgers, sausages, what have you. Then here is the shank, usually from the knee down to where the trotter is. Um, yeah, so first we're going to start out. We're going to score it into about two inch sections. This bottom piece right here, that will be used for later. You can use that in stocks or, you know, take a little bit of meat off and grind it. So score the meat all the way around the shank. You're going to hit the bone. That's how you know you're doing a good job. And then just do that all into your section. So it looks like we can get about two good pieces out of this shank. 
Um, Where did you learn to do this, Jesse? Just by working in the kitchen. Um, if I find something that I want to learn how to do, I'll reach out to somebody that does know how, or I'll do the research and study and do it myself. Some of it's a lot of trial and error. Some of it comes along pretty quickly. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling pretty good with a knife and I really enjoy animal butchery, seeing the entire process from start to finish. So something I do enjoy doing. All right, so now that that's sectioned off, um, Handy Bone Saw just came in the mail today or yesterday. We're going to find, I don't know if you can see that, where that bone begins. And just start sawing. you using anything before you got the bone saw in the mail? Um, I had a much larger bone saw that I would use <laughs> for larger, but it's like a 24 inch bone saw and I didn't think it would be conducive to doing home kitchen work. So it would at least be comical. Exactly. And I figured this is good for like in the field for breaking out pelvic bones or if you want to take the trotters off to cut down on weight a little bit. So it's a good tool to have. Definitely. And very clearly going to be a little bit of a workout too, which is always something fun to add in. Exactly. And where did you uh, where did you get the the venison at for for this round? Of so this cooking? came from uh, Warden Sarah uh, with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. She was a game warden, I believe, in Rutland County. She kindly gave me a few venison shanks for this episode, and also a roast, which I cooked for my family a couple weeks ago. Yeah, Warden Sarah is great. We um, we've had her on a couple times uh, cooking some great meals and. I know uh, she has led a couple of workshops with Vermont Fish and Wildlife around breaking down deer. And I obviously pre-pandemic when we could all get together, but I would highly suggest anybody who's tuning in that maybe didn't grow up doing this. Uh, you know, I consider myself an adult onset hunter, uh, but they're a great way to, to learn um, about a lot of these things that you maybe, you maybe didn't grow up with. Yeah, and there's always people out there willing to teach and share, so lots and lots of resources. So this also would go much faster if I was at a professional butcher shop with a bandsaw. Yes. So. so why are you breaking it down like that? Why couldn't you just cook it all like completely whole? So you can cook it whole. Um, I do that a lot of times. This is just another preparation where it's a little sexier on the plate. Um, Asabuco translates to bone with a hole. And when you expose those marrow bones, it just makes them 10 times more delicious. And that's, Adds in all that wonderful flavor packed in there. Yeah, all that like gelatinous goodness comes in and... You're in for a treat. I say this every time I'm on the show that I my biggest regret is having to be a computer screen away from all the great things that are being cooked because it's really it's really hard to be honest. Well, hopefully soon we could do these in person and people can actually taste what is cooked. Right. Yeah. So this back part of the bone or this top side of the bone is going to be a little bit longer because it goes from skinny to wider so just bear with me if there's any questions i'm more than happy to answer we have a question from michael bard asking wouldn't a cleaver work better than a utility knife um this is actually a bone saw it's not a utility knife um a cleaver would break the bone 
and you would get you'd get splinters it wouldn't be as clean of a cut and i mean you could chop it with a cleaver it just wouldn't be what i'm trying to attain with asabuco you want that clean cut and that's where a nice little saw comes in wonderful <laughs> If folks have any other questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Jesse's here to drop some knowledge on us all. He's been cooking for a long time professionally. And, you know, if you all have had the opportunity to eat some of his things, you know how good he is. All right. I'm going to switch blades. I would also highly suggest anybody uh, check out Jesse on Instagram. You know, his, uh, it's where he documents a lot of, you know, how he said indigenizing a lot of the food ways here and the ingredients that he's cooking with. And it's always worth a good follow as well. I'll drop the, the link in the chat here. My favorite, uh, most recent thing that I did was that beaver ham. That looked amazing. And I mean, how much time went into that? You, I mean, I guess how how much time would you say you spend cooking and working with different ingredients and in food? Um, well, it, it kind of depends if I'm doing it for the restaurant or for you know myself. A lot of the stuff, most of the stuff on the Instagram involving or all the stuff involving wild game is for myself, my family, or friends. Um, I do post stuff that I do at Sweetwaters from time to time. But I spend a lot of my free time when I do have downtime in the kitchen, just messing around with different new things, new uh, new game or new parts of game that I haven't messed with before. And what is it about? I mean, what is it about food for you that that really? allows you to spend so much time doing it obviously it's a passion of yours but is there anything else that really goes into it and what are you like looking to accomplish uh what i'm looking to accomplish i honestly don't know i guess the big thing with what i want to accomplish is for indigenous folks um whether that's abenaki or you know anyone in the new england area or farther on is getting these back on the plate. I know there's a lot of, you know, nations that do and have kept their food ways, but there's a lot that, you know, they've been lost through colonization. And I mean, I didn't, besides just, you know, my grandfather cooking, you know, venison burgers or roast, you know, I didn't, I was never growing up with our traditional food ways, so. It's about reconnecting and reclaiming what has been lost. Yeah, I think that's that really comes through in, in a lot of what I've seen you do and definitely appreciate being able to learn from you as well. Mm -hmm. how, is, uh, how has it been, like, the reception for, for going out and, like you said, reclaiming these food ways? And, and what are you hoping that people are getting out of something like today? Um, the reception has been amazing. People really enjoy seeing what I come up with. I mean, me personally, I enjoy seeing what other native chefs are doing and I'm really inspired every day from just their knowledge and what they're doing. I try to emulate that and, you know, steer myself in that direction. And what I want people to realize is, you know, something as simple as corn, you know, that's been here for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years we were stewards of that cultivar you know it was a symbiotic relationship it needed us to grow and we needed it to survive and you know there are relatives and it's about reclaiming and continuing that relationship with the natural world so just bear with me this is tough Tough, but worth it. Worth and it. again, folks, if, if you all have questions for Jesse, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, he's here and willing, so I would definitely encourage you to take the opportunity. The 
big bone knife would have been good. I think it's what. Oh, and you pulled out the cleaver. All yeah. right, Michael, you're being you're being vindicated. Just for finishing. I do think that's one of the things that I love most about wild ingredients though too and just cooking in general is just you got to work with it you know it's not it's not something that it's not just something that's prepackaged it's not something that um is coming to you <clears throat> already it it requires some some love to go into it and some reveration as well Exactly So from here after it's cut there is some bone specks and other you know, debris that comes off when you're doing it. So just give it a nice wipe down. You don't want any bones in there. And then from here, trust the old butcher twine. It's a little hank of it. And we're going to tie it. That just keeps everything together. If you see there's different, you know, muscles and sinews and all that, you just want to keep that all together in the cooking process. So we're going to go right in the middle. And then one, two, and that'll just create a knot that holds tight. So you can tie another overhand knot and secure that so that way it won't move. Then we're just going to cut the butcher twine off. Right here, you can do salt and pepper. Um, whenever I'm cooking anything, I like to just cook with salt and then finish with pepper. And why is that? I find sometimes the pepper burns, and I don't like the mm. taste. So that's why I just go with the salt. <laughs> In the morning yeah 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 sorry about that I was just talking no 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 sorry I think that's one of the things we love about the show is that we're in people's homes and this is what people are doing so <laughs> by all means we've had we've had cats on the counter uh <laughs> children helping it's it's all good perfect you know we got some really good questions coming in too Jesse and uh, I know you and I have been able to have some really good conversations around, you know, sovereignty efforts around native foods and native nations. And I, I just want to, you know, give you the opportunity to kind of speak to it. You mentioned how you're working to reclaim some of the Abenaki foodways and relearning. Uh, for those who are looking to support this type of work, you know, what would, where would be best for them to plug in? And like, what are you really trying to get out of it as well? So, I mean, if they're looking to help out, um, Noel Hegan is working with NOFA with the Abenaki Land Link Project to where, you know, farmers in Vermont and farmers, I think mostly just farmers in Vermont are uh, growing our crops for us. And then they go back to the Abenaki tribe and then they're distributed so that we have a little less stress as far as food goes. And so that's Nolhegan Land Link Project. All Navaiwe is another one. And Seeds of Renewal. So I just added some bear fat into the cast iron. You can see it's smoking. And I'm dredging the shank into flour. And I'm going to sear it. So for those who don't necessarily have, have bear fat around, is there any other alternatives that people might be able to use? And honestly, what was your process for, for getting the bear fat available for you? So you can use any high temp oil, olive oil works. You can do it in butter too. Uh, butter has a lower smoking point. So you would want it clarified or add butter. Uh, actually the bear fat was given to me from Chief Don with Noel Hagen. And it was whole fat. I froze it, cubed it, 
and then just rendered it low and slow until it liquefied. And I'll see if I can show you. Oh, nice. And what type of flavor do you think that adds into the dish? It's just so savory and delicious. I can't even describe it. I've been cooking everything in bear fat. I even made maple kettle corn in bear fat. That sounds awesome. <laughs> okay. So while that is browning, we're going to get our mirepoix ready. It's just one small carrot. Uh, these are this is two socks of celery broken down and half a large onion. And what are your what are your thoughts, Jesse, around you know wild food versus farmed food or you know cultivated food in general? Um, you know where your food came from. For one, you have a relationship with the animal that you're eating. And beyond that, from a cultural perspective, an indigenous cultural perspective, I can use other parts of that animal besides the meat. So like the deer, I'll save hides or right now, oftentimes a lot of those hides are given to me from other hunters that normally would just get wasted. I can save the sinew and I use that in sewing I do. So just having that connection and that relationship with the animal, using it to its fullest, which you don't get from a package of beef at the store. Yeah, that's very true. Very, very true. And I think too, I mean, you know, we're using carrots and celery and onions right now too. And, you know, during, you know, Vermont has some of the a great farm fresh food as well that, that pairs wonderfully. But it sounds like coming back to that, like connection with who's growing it and how, you know, it's affecting um, and being treated. What's that? Uh, just, uh, you know, being able to pair, to pair your, to pair your wild food with, with good, farmed food as well like the carrots and the stuff in the garden exactly this time of year is obviously tough with the winter but it's nice to know the people that you're growing your food you know that you don't get that in like a hannaford's or a price chopper so I'm yeah just that is up. um you don't have to be so fine you can chunk it up but this is your basic mirepoix, the celery, onions, carrots, adds flavor and body to the meat and the liquid from the braise. And once that asabuco comes out, we're going to add these in and saute them in that same fat and get all those delicious bits of fawn at the bottom of the pan out with wine after as well. It's already making me, it's making me hungry already. Hannah, Hannah in the chat asked if you aged the venison at all. Um, I did not. This came straight from Warden Sarah to myself and then went in the freezer until today. You can age venison. Um, it's best to do it, I believe, right around 35 degrees. And also when you're aging it, it's best to keep the hide still on so that way when muscles dry, they contract. So that kind of just keeps everything in the place and really just concentrates those flavors. Wonderful. All right, so here's this. The awesome we go. We're gonna switch again. Turn that heat down. So this recipe as well is for three asabuco. I just, for the sake of time and me not struggling with that uh, saw, I just cut down one. But this recipe is for three. You could even do four, depending how many you have. Turn that heat back up. 
<laughs> and Jesse, you had, <clears throat> you had mentioned, you know, the Seeds of Renewal project and we have some folks in the chat, you know, asking about indigenous crops that the Abenaki grew or collected. And I'm going to drop in the chat right now. There's a great book by, by Fred Weisman called Seven Sisters, Ancient Seeds and Food Systems of the Wabanaki People in the Chesapeake Bay region. And I would highly suggest, you know, folks check that out. It's a, it's a great way to get acquainted with, you know, some of those seeds that have been around for, you know, generations and generations and uh, some of the stories behind it too. Yeah, it's a great book. And we're, we're finding and reclaiming more and more seeds every year too. All right, so now I'm just prepping the gremolata while that is working. I just took one cup of picked parsley and I'm chopping through it. Also have two cups of last year's fiddleheads that I've been saving in the freezer. Those came from a Penobscot friend up in Maine. Oh, fiddleheads! I know. <laughs> with with all the snow melting, I've been I've been looking out for uh, some of the green to start popping. Those are always a, a fun early spring oh. forage, provided yeah. you do it sustainably, as as always. Exactly. So now that that's chopped, I'm just going to add it to a mixing bowl. So I have some garlic that I confit in bear fat uh, a little while ago, so I'm just going to add that into there. The zest of one lemon. My microplane's at work, so this will have to do. And this just adds really a beautiful brightness to that savory asabuco. I know I often in the kitchen are pulling audibles on different different uh, tools to use to What's be that? able to get using audibles to for different tools to zest a lemon or oh, cut yeah. something up or you know what have you then we're gonna add the juice any seeds just pick them out then we're gonna go back over here we have a we had a question come in jesse from michelle that you know, they have a young hunter at home who is interested in small game hunting, especially around squirrels. Yeah. And was wondering if you had any recommendations on recipes that are amenable to using the, using the meat. You know, it's important for, she's saying that it's important for uh, the young hunter to make sure that they're not wasted, but their cooking prowess isn't necessarily uh, up to the challenge all the time. Um, there's lots of things you can do. You can cook them down in a braise, just shred the meat for tacos. You can roast it whole like a rabbit, quarter it, and do country fried squirrel. Uh, bone it out, chop it up, do it in like a meat pie. I mean, the possibilities are really endless. Anything that you could, you would use like rabbit or chicken or any other small game you could use squirrel for. It's a really, it's a really complex flavor too. I was pleasantly surprised this year uh, hunting squirrel for the first time, just how much depth there was to it. Yeah, exactly. So I added some white wine and I'm letting that reduce. I've got water blanching for the fiddleheads. And then I'm going to get the polenta working. So I'm going to add 
three and a half cups of water and one cup of milk. I'm going to bring that to a boil. So like the traditional, I guess, ratio for polenta is a four to one. I like it a little creamier, so I add a little extra liquid. Is, is that your sous chef in the background, Jesse? Oh, uh, yeah, that's my oldest. Well, my, one of my youngest son, or my youngest son and my oldest son. So tomato paste, about two tablespoons. Now I'm adding chicken stock. I don't have any game stock or beef stock, so about three cups. You want it to come up about three quarters of the way onto the asabuco. All right. So we're going to get a garni or a bouquet garni ready. Just like one stem of parsley. One sprig of rosemary and a bunch of thymes and a bay leaf. So what this does is add some aromatics and depth to that braise. I'm trying to find my butcher twine. Cut off a little hank. And then tie it up. And you and I were, you know, you and I were talking a little bit earlier this week kind of about that approach to using the whole animal and mm -hmm. how that's really key to a lot of your cooking and what you're trying to get across with like you said reclaiming Abenaki foodways w would you care to speak to that a little bit a little bit more about why why that's so important and you know i guess some tips on some people who might be trying to do the same too yeah so with using the whole animal, um, I don't see hunting as a sport or for trophy. So just like one example would be a moose. If you're going to hunt a moose, um, instead of getting the shoulder mount, the nose is the most delicious piece of meat that I've ever had in my life. And I was actually able to try it for the first time this September. I was invited up to my buddy's moose camp on Penobscot territory in Maine. And that was the goal was to cook moose nose. And we were not disappointed. I followed that very closely on your Instagram <laughs> and it looked, it looked amazing. It was, yeah, it was absolutely delicious. All right. So we got the fiddleheads blanching just about a minute, minute and a half. Um, the water and cream mixture working. The Osabuco braise ready to go in the oven. So just cover it and 300 degrees for about between two and three hours. So then a little studio okay. magic. <laughs> That's my favorite, my favorite part about these shows. Wow! And this is it. And if you all want an up close look at what that looked like before it went into the oven, again, check out Jesse's Instagram page. Uh, the first photo on there is everything that he just cooked up, and uh, right before it went into the oven, and it looks amazing. So we're just going to make a little ice bath for those fiddleheads. Should have had this sooner. 
So why are you making the ice bath? What's the what's the purpose behind that? So it shocks them and stops the cooking. So it, they won't get mushy or cook further than I want them. Gives them that that crispness still, rather than that gross <laughs> that gross taste of like kind of canned vegetables that I remember from growing up. Exactly. All right. So that. So this is coming to a boil. I've got one cup of how many grits? This came from a good friend of mine, Corn Mafia, um, Warrior of the Rainbows, how many grits? He does small batch Iroquois, Iroquois and other indigenous corns. He's Mohawk. It's the most delicious hominy I've ever had, the most delicious grits I've ever had, and the most delicious cornmeal I've ever had in my life. So check that out. I think that's a really good point, too. You know, as folks are diving into this, maybe sometimes for the first time, uh, cooking wild ingredients or really just thinking about the food that's on their plate, it really does matter where you're buying your food from. Uh, you know, the likelihood of foraging your whole meal or collecting wild ingredients, you know, is low and it's okay to supplement it. But really think about where it's coming from, whether that's a local farmer or, you know, if that's supporting um, indigenous citizens that are really making sure that there's amazing food out there for people to enjoy. Yeah. And this is supporting a good friend, supporting an indigenous company. And beyond that, it's just delicious. So you don't get any more delicious. Than this. I think that's the, that's the whole driving force behind most of it. We have a comment from Catherine that says, you know, they're not much of an eat meter, <laughs> an eat meter, a meat eater. And I, they're really enjoying your presentation and they really love the way you're talking about food and your values and your goals and bringing indigenous cooking practices back into the kitchen. So thank you so much coming from Catherine. So a lot of times I'll uh, test out wild game recipes at work. And then for any staff that wants to try them, I make them a little meal. And I've actually had two people who are vegan try wild game and they loved it. So something to say. That's awesome. And we have a we have a question and some responses about how to store fiddleheads. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, about how to freeze them. They they say when they do it, they often churn. They often churn brown for them. Honestly, I don't know. Anytime I've gotten fiddleheads before this, I've always eaten them right away. These ones, well, uh, they just stuck in the freezer and they were fine. Um, yeah, I know you can probably yeah. use them for long term storage or something, but. That's what I, my experience has been blanching them and they've hold, held up. And, you know, Sean says the same thing in the comments, but just a quick, a quick water bath for, you know, 30 seconds or so, pull them out, put them in uh, some cold water and you could throw them in the freezer for a couple months and they're pretty good. Yeah, actually, I mean, I do that with ramps. Yeah. And uh, Karen was wondering if you could repeat the grand, uh, the brand of the grits again. And I'll put that in the chat. Yeah. Um, it's... Here, I'll show you. So on Instagram, he does. I don't think he has a website yet, but it's Corn Mafia, C O R N M A F I A. And again, folks, if you have any questions for Jesse, if you have any questions. Um, in general, or ideas or stories to share, please feel free to drop them in. We have Amanda that says, I remember when you first told me of this idea of bringing back indigenous food years ago. So proud of how far you've come since tossing around the idea. Good job, Jesse. I, are you, did you just agree to do this so you could get public praise? Is that, exactly. is, that <laughs> is that our plan here is to, to make sure that people can, can say how great you are? That is a plan. I actually do very poorly most times with that. 
and I've thought about deleting my Instagram many times as more people follow. But oh, I I, I think you would be a big loss if you deleted your Instagram. Um, it's been a real it's been a real pleasure to be able to follow it. Thank you. And you were you were making moccasins too earlier this year, right? It was one of your COVID projects. It seemed like yeah, never, uh, was that. I never finished it. Oh, so, no. All right. So I'm going to add some bear fat to the gremolata. Um, traditionally, it would have been olive oil. But in the spirit of everything bear fat, that's what I'm using. And what will the remolata be used for, Jesse? This will... Um, one second. So it'll act as both a garnish and to bring some brightness and act as a com condiment for the shanks. So traditionally, gremolata over um, like veal asabuco with risotto milanese, which is saffron risotto. I couldn't find my saffron, so we're just doing plain grits. We have a question of what is a gremolata? <laughs> it's it's uh, an Italian condiment. It's it's just uh, parsley, uh, lemon zest, lemon juice, oil, salt, garlic. Very bright and vibrant. Wonderful. You can use it on fish. Different meats, poultry. And Jennifer Davis in the comments, she's asking, you know, what was your favorite wild game that you were surprised you liked? Uh, she says that. Uh, they did not expect to like beaver as much as they did, for example, when they had it for the first time. Beaver was interesting. Um, I read a lot about it before I tried it and talked to people, and everybody's like, it's delicious. It's like a very you know mild flavor. And I, the, I made andouille sausage with beaver, and my recipe wasn't quite right, and it turn, didn't turn out too great. But the ham I did was just absolutely amazing. Beaver is definitely one of those meats. I never liked bear growing up, but now that I know how to treat meat, it's a whole nother ball game. Mm. So I just mix those fiddleheads into that remoulade. Then we're gonna turn back. The grits are coming along. Another couple minutes. Wow. Those look amazing. And too, as they cook, as they cook, the meat shrinks and pulls back and the bone gets exposed and it just makes it nice and sexy. So what's the benefit of cooking venison for as long as you did? You said two to three hours to be putting that in the oven for uh, what does that do to the dish so that kind of meat on the shank is a muscle that gets worked quite a bit so it tends to be tough if you were just to cook it like a back strap so cooking it low and slow you really just tenderize and make a beautiful piece of meat so it, ten it tenderizes it and makes it so you're not throwing it into the grind pile yeah it would be uh it would be a shame to to see that beautiful piece of meat kind of go into that grind pile when you can do something so wonderful with it exactly so i think I, i'm curious you know obviously this takes a lot of time a lot of prep um a lot of love that goes into it why is that why is that something that's so important to you? Um, not only just as a chef, but as a person for how much time and effort you're putting into this wonderful food. 
Um, I find that there's very few things in life that come quickly. And so even with some of the art I do, it's not instant gratification, like ordering a uh, Havilon butcher saw and getting it two days later. You really appreciate whatever that is more. Ooh. Look at that bone, it fell right out. <laughs> no, no, you know it's good. So I'm just taking that butcher twine off. Never serve meat with a butcher twine on. Especially if you're in a commercial kitchen. Exactly. <laughs> so this is thickened up. I've already seasoned it. Let's what did you put for the seasoning? Just salt. And then I'm going to add two tablespoons of butter. Wonderful. So can you, would you mind explaining a little bit, like why, why this combination of food, like what led to, you know, the fiddleheads and the asobuco and the polenta all together? Where, what was your thinking behind it? Um, it was just, I don't know, it was something I've had in my mind for a while. And I thought this was a good opportunity to, to test it and, you know, doing something classic like this from another culture and making it my own using our indigenous ingredients. Because a lot of times, if you think of something like polenta as very Italian, it's, it's really not. Nowhere else in the world was corn prior to European contact in the Americas. So that is an indigenous crop. Like for all intents and purposes, polenta is an indigenous dish just cooked by another culture. You know, um, Chef Nephi Craig, he's a White Mountain Apache chef. He put it, well, you take something like ratatouille, which is a classic French dish, dish, but the tomatoes, the eggplant, the zucchini, the squash, those are all indigenous to the Americas. So that, I mean, for all intents and purposes as well, is an indigenous dish just prepared in a very French way using indigenous ingredients. So that's kind yeah. of my take on that. I think that's, uh, I think that's a, it's a really powerful way to look at food too. Uh, you got to kind of expand your, your lens, right? Of how, how you're viewing things. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I see food like food cultures, um, when people think of food cultures, people don't think of indigenous foods or Native American foods as its own food culture when it is. And you look at any other food culture in the world, that wouldn't be where it is today without cultivars from the Americas. So you've got capsaicin from chilies and hot peppers, which is are very prevalent in Asian food, Thai food, Japan or Japanese food, Chinese cooking. Those were only, I think they came up as far north as Georgia, um, the, the Chiltepine pepper, and those were nowhere else in the world prior to colonization of the Americas. Same thing with corn, beans besides garbanzo beans and soybeans. Those are all indigenous crops. So... Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild to think about. Uh, because that's not the narrative that, that we've been peddled for for years, for so long. No, not at all. All right, so now we're going to plate it. Um, in indigenous households back in the day, they were always done family style. So we got a big Vermont maple wooden bowl. Oh. And if folks if folks have a chance to watch one of those bowls be made, uh, it's pretty it's pretty spectacular and amazing to see the care that goes into that. You know, while you're plating, Jesse, we have a question about venison neck roast and whether that's worth saving or should be ground for burger. 
Uh, I would save it. I did a venison neck roast. I marinated it in a miso maple glaze oh my God. and let it sit for three days. It was phenomenal. <laughs> so amazing. Those puff cuts of meat is just how to make them tender. So that's either cooking for a low, slow period of time, whether roasting or braising or marinating. Marinating, you know, using acid and fat will tenderize and break down meat as well. So it's just how do you get that tough meat not tough? Yeah. It's like brisket, which is a very tough cut of meat. You want to smoke that or cook that low and slow for many, many hours. It's the same thing with wild game. And that's a lot of what I do as well is I'll translate that for my profession, professional knowledge and how to work the game that way. That, that seems to speak a lot to what you were saying earlier, just about appreciating the food too and, and not necessarily looking for that instant gratification. Exactly. And there's been many, um, many times like I'll conceptualize a dish or something that I think will taste good and it won't. So I think your, your sous chef is, is saying how much they are excited for this meal coming up. I hope so. Wow. <laughs> And the last time is anytime you braise something, save those juices. Whether you use it on that dish as a sauce or save it for something later, that marrow, just how gelatinous and delicious that is, is. Wow. What a treat. So. <laughs> There you oh, go. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for joining us in the Vermont Wild Kitchen today and, you know, just being a wealth of information as well as you go through and cook all of this. We can't say thank you enough for yeah. your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is what I enjoy doing. I'm more than happy to chat or give advice to people through my Instagram. Um, any questions, comments, concerns? And also, I'm not a pro, so if there's any tips out there, I'm always open ears and go from there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's so great about this show is that, I mean, Jesse, you, you by all means are a pro, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks who are on here aren't necessarily pros. They're just folks that are cooking and enjoying food and enjoying wild ingredients and pairing it up with local, local ingredients as well. Right. I just dropped in the chat. Jesse's Instagram, go and give him a follow. It is definitely worth it. Uh, you know, he is just has some amazing food being peddled out there and a lot of information and knowledge coming too. And, you know, we're really excited because we're going to be continuing to work with Jesse uh, coming up here in the future. We're going to be doing a couple more uh, shows based around Abenaki Foodways and really exploring a lot of these indigenous ingredients and uh, really, again, making sure that we're celebrating all the ways that local food is showing up in people's lives because too often times, uh, you know, there's a little bit, of, there's a little bit of a, of a hurdle to be jumping over. So Jesse, thank you so much for joining us in the Vermont wild kitchen. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, if you all have any other questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, look out for us next month. It's the third Thursday of every month. And we'll be coming back to you uh, with the Vermont Wild Kitchen. And then, like I said, look out for more episodes featuring Jeff, Jesse coming up here soon. So with that, I'm going to wish everybody good night. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy uh, the upcoming spring. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it.